All right. Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to Credit Sesame's Facebook page. My name is Tess Wicks, and I am the founder of Wander Wealthy, which is a YouTube channel. You can find me at youtube.com slash Wander Wealthy by Tess Wicks. And we're also a community for millennials who are looking to advance their personal finances, get insights around personal development, and of course, travel, because it's a big passion of mine. And speaking of travel, I'm actually coming to you all from Milan, Italy. I don't know if you saw my last live where I talked about budget travel hacks, specifically finding really cheap flights. But yes, I live in Milan, which is why it is dark outside, and I'm coming to you at 11 p.m. But this is the life I live as a location-independent nomad teaching personal finance online. So I am a finance coach. I also create tons of content around personal finance, and I love it. And today, I'm gonna be sharing with you guys the top five finance tips that I wish I had known when transitioning from college to career. Now hear me out, if you have graduated a long time ago and you are already five, even 10 years into your career, I still think these tips are gonna be super applicable to you, so make sure you stay tuned. But I really wanted to put these together because it's June, the colleges are pretty much all graduated, I think, as far as like graduating college classes. We're starting the summer. Maybe people are starting their job now. Maybe they're waiting until August. And I figured I would love to deliver a message on those top tips that I wish I would have been told, the things I wish I would have been warned about or would have just been told so that I could be ahead of the curve, ahead of the pack, or at least ahead of my own curve. Because I think we should really only compare ourselves to our, our past and just make sure that we're moving forward. So these are some things that I think will be really helpful for you, whether you are transitioning from college to career or you've been in your career for a long time. You can always just make sure, use this as like a checklist to make sure you're checking those boxes and you have these things under wraps. So I have five of them, like I said, and I'm going to be giving a couple of tips and maybe rules of thumb or just little tidbits that I think will help you with each of these five things. So we're gonna dive into them just slightly, not to take up too much time, but give you enough information so that you can then use that to your benefit as you go and make sure you check those boxes. Make sure that you know these things about your new life as a full-time income generating person. So make sure you get your notepad and a pen out so you can take notes because this is gonna be jam packed of good stuff. So let's get started. The first thing that I wish I would have known so much when I first, even while I was in college, before I started in my career was that negotiating your starting salary does not mean and does not run you the risk of that offer being taken off of the table by your prospective employer. So I think this is really, really important because your starting salary is going to be the baseline for how much income you can have and bring into your life for the next however many years you choose to stay at a company. Now with millennials these days, it can be you know a shorter period of time, but I think our goal should always be to do our best at the company that we're at, and we might as well raise that bar and make sure that that bar is set so that we are set up for a realistic life that we can live, whether you need to move to a new city and it might be really expensive, or you need to pay your student loans, you need to make sure that you're making enough income. You also just need to make sure that your income is competitive to the market. So it's so important to do this. I think the reasons people don't do it, or one of the big reasons is because they're afraid of how that's going to come off. They're afraid that maybe the um, employer is going to take away that offer and go, never mind, I didn't realize you were going to try to negotiate this. I feel like I'm giving you a lot. And maybe it feels greedy or it feels like you have these expectations and you don't want to you know, send the wrong message. But to be honest, every hiring manager expects you to negotiate your salary. They almost budget for starting salaries with that in mind. So it's so important for you to 
recognize that they expect you to negotiate. So now come to the table with a negotiation. A couple quick tips when it comes to negotiation is first, knowledge is powerful in this case. It is so important to come to that meeting or whatever it is prepared. And by the way, if this is not your first salary acceptance offer, you can still negotiate your salary. That's what annual reviews can be for. Or you can even request a semi annual review, a review in six months to just go over the things that you have accomplished. So make sure you are keeping documentation of all the things that you are doing that bring value to the company because that will be a powerful tool for you to use in future potential negotiations. But if you are just starting out with a new career, then this is so important. Make sure you come to that meeting or you come to the negotiating table prepared. You do your research and you can look at comparable jobs, comparable positions in your area. I would recommend looking at the city that you are going to move to, whether you're in the current city, then just look at the city that you live in or look at the city that you're about to move to and look at that job and what the starting salary on average is in that area. Just know that there's different cities have different costs of living, so it can range. So it's really important to figure out what it is in that area. But you can also do research like interviewing other people who've had similar jobs or just asking around to peers. And I know that can, that can feel a little bit uncomfortable, but it's so important to have these open conversations so that we can be equipped with this knowledge and use it to our advantage. Another really good thing to do is to potentially get another offer and use that offer as leverage. So you can kind of find, you know, you don't have to just get an offer just to use it. You can find companies that you would like to work for, both of them, but it's also a great option for you to use the information there for your leverage in negotiating. And the last thing I'll say is when you do come to the negotiating table, make sure you know what your strengths are, what the company's strengths are, and what their weaknesses are, and how you can fill in those gaps. Come to the table with potentially maybe a couple case study ideas of things that maybe they aren't doing that you could provide or ideas that you have that maybe they have never thought of. Ways that you're going to be able to provide value and you have to be prepared so that you and you go there and you say, hey, these are all the things I think I can do to help the company in XYZ position. They see that you've already done your homework and that's when you can start having that salary conversation and it will be a lot easier for you to make your case that way. Okay, so that's the first thing. Moving on to the second thing that I wish I would have known when I transitioned from college to career, and that is that what you see, the number that you see in that offer is not what you get. And this might be obvious to some people, but to others, I think we so often make this mistake where we go, oh, I got an offer, I'm gonna get paid $40,000 a year. So that means that 30% of that I can use in living expenses. But yes, this is kind of a general rule of thumb, but $40,000 after taxes and after potentially putting money away for retirement and after other, you know, Social Security, Medicare, other things that your company takes out of your paycheck before you get paid, that's going to make a big difference. That might mean that you can't afford that apartment that you've been eyeing for so long. Another thing is, the, the truth of the matter is student loans are a big thing and we often get slapped with a pretty big student debt bill. So remember that you have debt to pay, you have taxes to pay, you have benefits that you're going to want to take advantage of because I'm going to talk about that next. And so what you see on paper is not actually what you get deposited into your bank account. And that is so important for budgeting and planning. Let's say you're going to move to a new city and you want to figure out how much you can afford to rent an apartment. That is really important to know how much you're actually going to be making in your bank, not necessarily making in a gross salary. So just keep that in mind because that will go a long way for you. Okay, the next thing, the third thing, we're breezing through, the, through this. The third thing I wish I would have known and really would have, wish I would have taken advantage of was to put as much money as possible into my 401k. And for you, you can read this as any type of employer-sponsored 
benefit, specifically retirement benefit. So you might not have a 401k. It might be a different form of retirement benefit. And I do know that some people don't have 401ks and that's where you look at, okay, how can I sock away money in a different way? Whether it's uh, getting an IRA or it's looking at other types of investment accounts or even just sucking your money away in savings account, but putting as much money aside so that you can expand your future. And this tip is kind of twofold. First of all, let's speak specifically about 401ks, which you could have a different type of, like I said, employer-sponsored retirement plan if you work for maybe a government agency or a university. But in general, the advice kind of comes in the same breath, and that is to put as much money as you can there because you get tax advantages, which pay off big time. The other thing you potentially could get if your employer offers this is matching contributions. And this is where the real money comes in because you are guaranteed a return now. If you contribute a certain dollar amount, your employer is going to say something like, we will match you 100% dollar for dollar, or maybe we'll match you 50% of how much you contribute up to a certain percentage of your income. There will be some sort of formula like that. So talk to your hiring manager, your boss, or the HR manager, and get an understanding of how your 401k works and those matching contributions and make, make sure that you're taking full advantage of that. But beyond that, what I really wish I would have done was put away as much money into my 401k before I even saw it get deposited into my bank account so that I wouldn't have inflated my lifestyle and my life so much with the money that I was being paid in my bank and more money could have gone away into my 401k. That would have had me set up far above and beyond my peers and even people five to 10 years older than me because of this really magical thing called compound interest. So when you start putting money away in your 401k, you can start getting invested. This is also a really easy way to start getting invested before you know having to open up a brokerage account. You can just do it through your 401k. And like I said, compound interest. It's one of the wonders of the world and it will multiply your money, especially as time goes on. If you have more time that is really on your side and you want to take advantage of that. So this is something that, like I said, it's. I wish I would have known. And I think that a lot of people are afraid to do this because they're afraid they're not going to have enough money to live on. But as human beings, we are so fascinatingly flexible and we really you know, bend to the shape of what we are given. And if we're given a little bit less money, then we eat out a little less or we take a step back in some way. So the other thing is that right now it is, if you are transitioning from college to career, socially acceptable for you to be living on a little less. You are just a recent college grad and you can still have roommates and you don't have to worry. I mean, if you don't have a spouse yet, you don't have to worry about someone being like, oh, well, I'm going to have to stay the night at my girlfriend or boyfriend's house with all their roommates because right now is the perfect time to take advantage of that. When you, as you get older, things change, lifestyles change. It's harder to have roommates with also your family and your kids. And so right now is the time to do it, to get it done, to put that money away. So whether it's in a 401k or a different type of retirement plan or a savings account or an investment account, take advantage of it. Okay. The next thing, fourth thing that I wish I would have been smarter about was to remember that an emergency savings fund should have taken precedence over the big I'm finally making money lifestyle. So I get it. When you graduate from college or when you just get a new job that pays you a little more, you want to start living a little more. And that makes sense. However, it is so, so wise to make sure that you have an emergency savings fund set up before you start living large. And I know I just talked all about how you got to put your money in a 401k and it's hard to make sure that you do all of this stuff at the same time. There's going to be a couple of different things, the 401k and then this emergency savings fund. And then next, the next thing I'm going to talk about are going to be pieces of your financial life that you're going to feel torn over. But I'll say this now, you can kind of do all of it at once if you want to. You can also tackle them separately, but the emergency savings fund, I would say, is the most 
important. So you don't have to go wild with your 401k. Hit that matching contribution, but also make sure you build this emergency savings fund because the opposite of having an emergency savings fund is going into debt. So if you lose your job, if you if your car breaks down, if your computer, your laptop gets stolen, those are situations where you're going to have to, if you have an emergency savings fund, you get to dig into it. You've already saved for these situations. But if you don't, more than likely, you're going to have to put it on a credit card. And that is going to bite you down the road. So take the time, take the first three to six to nine months to start building up this emergency savings fund. Now, a couple of tips with this. One is set up a separate savings account and either do direct deposit straight out of your paycheck, and you can set that up through your HR department, or just make sure that once your paycheck goes into your checking account, you automatically transfer some money into your emergency savings account to make sure you're saving for emergencies that you can't predict. Now, how much do you need in your emergency savings account? That's the second part of this. And that is, on average, you want, I would say, six months, six times your monthly fixed expenses. So these are things like debt, like your living expenses, your grocery bill, your gas bill. Those are things that you have to pay in order to survive and thrive in this world. So know that you're going to have to pay them. And if you lose your job tomorrow, it would be really nice to have maybe three to six months of that stashed away somewhere so you don't have to move back in with mom and dad. And if you're living with mom and dad, then you don't have to put all this stuff on a credit card. So this is so important to build up that emergency savings fund. The other reason why I say to do this right away is because you have not gotten into the habit of spending money and inflating your lifestyle to your new full-time, finally making a salary paycheck and income. You can, can, you can go from a scaled back lifestyle to a scaled back lifestyle and just pump that money into the emergency savings fund. And then once you hit that goal, you can either look at another goal and continue to live your lifestyle slightly scaled back for the next five years. And then you know, five years down the road, you've pumped so much money into, first you have that emergency savings fund, you've pumped a ton of money into that 401k or other plan. And also if you have debt, you've probably paid off a ch huge chunk of debt and you are years ahead of your peers and years ahead of probably people that are even older than you. And now you also have a huge chunk of money in a, an investment account that is growing with compound interest, which is Awesome. That is something that so many people fail to do and fail to take advantage of. Okay. I have my notes right here. So I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that I have everything and I'm covering everything. Okay. The fifth thing that I wish I would have been told and just been advised when transitioning from college to career is this. It's a little bit of a truth bomb, but your debt is your responsibility and you need to tackle it head on. So I'm talking student loan debt, credit card debt, your auto loan, your eventually mortgage, any other type of debt that you have accumulated, that is your debt. You need to pay it off. And if you can tackle it head on, you can get way ahead of the curve. Not only can you save a lot of money in interest, especially if you can pay it off early, but you can also free up that money then to go into your 401k, or if you've really been crushing both your debt and your 401k, maybe you can live a little now, but you really need to make sure you make your debt a priority. Now let's talk specifically for students. The most common debt that they're graduating with is likely student loan debt. That's just unfortunately the truth and the world that we live in right now. So if you have student loan debt, know that for the most part, a lot of student loans provide a six month grace period before you have to start paying them back, but not all of them. So you need to do your research on your own loans that you have accumulated. Talk to your uh, student loan office in your school, the financial aid office in your school. Also, if you know who your service provider is, contact them and figure out when do you need to start making those payments and what payment options do you have and what are the payment terms on your debt? So if you do have some sort of federal loan, there's likely opportunities to get a little bit more favorite, favorable payment terms, like maybe an income-based repayment plan, or maybe you have some sort of forgiveness. You want to be educated. You want to know what exactly to expect. 
The other reason why you need to know these things is because we need to start planning. Not only will this help you be equipped for your negotiating when you're, your negotiations, when you're negotiating your salary, you can also know how much you're going to set aside for your 401k. You can figure out how much you're going to need to save into your emergency savings. It can set you up. And all of these things are kind of a circle. All these five things kind of feed each other. And it's really important to just sit down and have an honest look at your finances and really take responsibility for that. So take responsibility for your debt today for those student loans. Figure out what your options are, when you need to start paying them so that you don't default on them, you don't hurt your credit with them. Really become educated on how you can go about paying those off and start putting a plan in place for that, for your emergency savings, for your 401k, and of course, for your future salary. Congratulations if you are transitioning from college to career. That is so awesome. It's so great to start in this new place of life, to start taking responsibility. I know that sounds a little scary, but it's exciting too because now you get to make your own decisions with your money and you can do some really, really smart things with it if you take some of this advice and you continue to do your own research and get educated. So good for you for joining me today. Those are the five things that I wish I would have known. I wish someone would have told me. I wish I would have just taken action on when I transitioned from college to career. And remember, you don't have to be transitioning. If you've been working for five years, for 10 years, you can still do a lot of these things. You can make sure that you're checking these boxes. You're taking full advantage of putting money away into your employer-sponsored retirement plan. You're putting an emergency savings fund together. It can be a little harder to scale back your life now that maybe you've let it inflate, but it is so important to do so to make sure that you get those financial ducks in a row. So you can totally do it too. This is definitely not just for those graduates, but if you are a graduate, you can get ahead of the curve. This is your opportunity to take full advantage of the great advice that you have for you. So thank you all for joining me. I had so much fun hanging out with you tonight. And make sure to come check me out at youtube.com slash wanderwealthy by Tesswix. Or you can visit wanderwealthy.com to see my blogs and get to the videos from there and join some of my other free trainings. So thank you so much. I will talk to you all later.